who seek for social reform, seek changes in human society in the United States. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Partly inspired by the teachings of the Second Great Awakening. <laughs> teachings of the Second Great Awakening. Right there. Focus, guys. The teaching of the Second Great Awakening. Many people sought social reform. They wanted to change the quality of human life. They wanted to change the United States, hopefully for the better. The first reform movement we're going to talk about is the prison reform movement. Um, the purpose of the United States prisoner system began to change during this time from punishment to rehabilitation. Because of the prison reform movement today, the purpose or the purpose of prisons or what should be their purpose is to rehabilitate their prisoners, make them into more functioning individuals once they get out of, uh, of the prison. We're not always successful in that. In fact, we're kind of very bad at it, even with the reform compared to other countries. But that's the purpose of the prison um, system now. Instead of punishment, the main purpose is to rehabilitate a person. Not that bad. It's already on the desk. All right. Um, the mentally ill, and this is something that we, you guys will cover in psychology if you ever have psychology. The mentally ill back in the 1800s or the early 1800s were usually put in prison. People didn't know what to do with them. Yes, sir. Um, I was giving something else. Okay, that's not it. People didn't quite know what to do with the mentally ill because we haven't diagnosed, we don't really diagnose mentally ill people back in the 1800s. So what they would do is they would just dump it in prison. People who had bipolar disorders, people that have anxiety, people that have multiple personality disorders, those people were just dumped into prisons like they did something wrong. Um, so Dorothea Dix worked really hard to change that. So the mentally ill were usually put in prison. Dorothy Dix worked to reform mental health treatment in the United States. She's the one that said, that argued, that this is a condition. This is not, this is something that can be fixed. This is something that can be made better. We can't just put these people in prison. They didn't do anything wrong. It's not their fault that they have these mental disabilities or mental um, conditions. So she traveled the country and saw that the mentally ill were being treated very, very badly. A lot of them were being put in prison just because they're mentally ill. This will lead to professional treatment of the mentally ill in the United States. Mental hospitals that take care of these mentally ill, instead of putting them in prison, we actually work hard to try to, to um, fix them, try to make their condition better. Sorry. Professionalism or professional treatment. Professional treatment. All right, something that concerns you all, education reform. This idea, what we're doing right now, this is public education. This is paid for by taxpayers. This is paid for by your parents. My salary, your books, your desk are paid for by um, taxpayers. This, was, this is a very new concept. It only started in the early 1800s in the United States. For most of the 1800s, the concept of public education or tax paid education was very rare. There were only some communities that had public schools. So most people were not educated. A lot of people didn't know how to read, didn't know how to write. But that's going to begin to change after the Second Great Awakening where we have more public schools getting created in the United States. So tax supported schools, public schools, were rare in the early years of the United States. They were very rare. But then the 1800s hit. During the 1800s, many saw the benefits of public education. They, they saw the benefit of having an educated population. Number one, it instilled Republican and American values in its citizens. Ever since you were little, we've been teaching you Republican values, American values, how good the United States is, how good democracy is, we do the Pledge of Allegiance. That's something that came out of the 1800s. They saw, you know what, public education can make people learn these things. Morning, teachers and students, all students should be in their first period of class. Teachers, please 
remain in the hallway and make sure students get to where they need to be. We need to start clearing out hallways. We will have a delayed start. We still have traffic. Um, just an FYI, we still have a partial power outage. Some classrooms are fully operational with lights and power. Other classrooms have no lights but do have power. Teachers have been advised to consolidate or combine classrooms or use a classroom that is empty or has a conference period right now that has power. Please continue to do so and consolidate. Keep instruction going. We have restrooms also with power outages. So those restrooms will be locked students, but we do have some restrooms that are open uh, downstairs. So if you do need to go to the restroom, please give us a few minutes to, to get them ready and um, we should be able to resume regular class period here shortly. If you have any questions, teachers, please don't hesitate to buzz us in the office. Thank you. So in the 1800s, they saw the benefits of public education, how it can instill in, into people or American values and Republican values. That's what we're doing right now. That's mostly why we have public education today. Number two, teach them the meaning of hard work and discipline. Hard work and discipline is taught, hopefully taught, in public schools. Some of you haven't learned that yet. You have one year left. Which a lot of people back then saw the benefits of, especially when it comes to Factory jobs. Factory jobs. Schools are going to teach these kids how to work hard, how to be disciplined, and then when they get to these factory jobs, then they're going to do the same thing. A lot of what we do in schools, guys, are very, very old ideas that we haven't changed yet. Like, for example, the bell. The bell is for you to get used to working at a factory because that when that signals when your ship is over. So it's a very cynical view of education, but it's to prepare you to work for a factory, basically. And we haven't changed a lot of those ideas, even though most people don't work in factories today. Next, uh, Americanized immigrants. A lot of people were scared of these immigrants, the Irish and the Germans especially. And they thought public education is a good way to teach them American values, to make them into Americans. So we don't have to be scared as much of these immigrants because they're going to be just like us through public education. All right, if you hate your high school career, this is the guy to blame, Horace Mann. He is the Secretary of Education for the Massachusetts Board of Education. Uh, he is the one that came up with a lot of the ideas that we use today, like, for example, um, longer school terms. Longer school terms. Back in the early 1800s, before Horace Mann came up with this idea, students will usually go to school for about four months, three months. Um, then they would go to their farms and, and, and farm. But he's the one that came up with 10 months, nine months. That's what we have to do. Next, compulsory attendance. Make everybody go to school. Make it a law that everybody has to go to school. That's something that Horace Mann came up with also. A lot of these educational changes, because if some people are not going to be uh, are not going to be forced to go to school, then they're not going to go to school. We're not going to have an educated population. Next, education reform was mostly focused on the north, because again, they thought that the education will help people be accustomed to factory jobs, to do well in factory jobs. The south didn't really need it that much. So most of these education reforms, most of the public schools that were getting built, they were getting built in the north. Slaves did not benefit from any of these reforms. Actually, in some states, it is illegal to teach a slave how to read and how to write. To read and write. It was illegal to teach a slave to read and write. To read and write. <laughs> All right, the temperance movement. We talked about the temperance movement before. This is very much inspired by the Second Great Awakening. Um, a lot of the teachings of the Second Great Awakening focus on alcohol and how alcohol is bad for American society. So we get the temperance movement out of it. They thought America had a huge drinking problem. A huge drinking problem. If you're drunk, you're not going to be able to function well in your factory job, so factory system needed efficient labor. 
If you're hungover, you're not going to be able to do a very good job in your factory. Number two, eliminating alcohol or alcoholism will make for a better family life. There's a lot of stories of wives and children getting abused because people would drink a lot. So the temperance movement is fighting against that. Next, many saw drinking as an immigration issue. The Irish and the Germans, especially the Irish, they have a reputation of drinking a lot, of getting drunk. So the temperance movement saw this as an immigration issue also. Because the Irish and the Germans come from cultures where drinking is very common. So we got the temperance movement. At first, the temperance movement were not all out in their campaign. Uh, at first, they only urged their members to stop drinking. So at first, they were okay with just their members not drinking anymore. But then they became more extreme and they started advocating for the outlawing of alcohol in the United States. So at first, they were okay with just them not drinking. There's a little club of non-drinkers. And then they started advocating for the government, state governments and the federal government, to make laws that would ban or limit alcohol in the United States. So then they advocated for legal temperance. copy temperance from their governments. They got their first big victory in 1851 when they got the state of Maine to ban alcohol in their state. And then they're going to get their most, their achievement of nationwide prohibition with the 18th Amendment in the 1920s, but that's going to be very far off. Where everybody, all the states in the Union, will now ban alcohol. Alright, number four, the women's rights movement came out of the Second Great Awakening also. Women were treated like second class citizens in the early 1800s. And that's not really going to stop for a long time. Now I've got to put that phone away. Alright. Women who are treated like second-class citizens, the democratization of American democracy. We talked about how American elections in the United States have become more open, how they eliminated property requirements, but they only became open for who? For white men. It doesn't really affect women. Unfortunately, it did not apply, did not apply to women. In the early 1800s, we saw more people getting ready, getting ready, being able to vote, having suffrage but that did not apply to women, unfortunately. They were fighting against a culture that treated women like second-class citizens. They have this idea back then of cult, the cult of domesticity, which meant that women are supposed to be in charge of the household. They're the ones that's supposed to be running the home. That's their sphere. Making money, politics, that's for men. So the home was to be the woman's responsibility, making money, Politics, voting, that should be the man's responsibility. There's a separation of responsibility, and that's what the cult of this domesticity preaches. And a bunch, majority of Americans, that's what they believed in back then. That's why women were fighting against something that's very, very hard to fight against. There was the idea of Republican motherhood that we talked about that came out of the American Revolution. Mothers should raise their children to be good citizens, to like the United States. But in the 1800s, that wasn't enough for a lot of women. Taking care of the household, having that responsibility, teaching their kids to be good citizens, that wasn't enough for them. So women felt very limited by their role in society. They saw their husbands voting, they saw their husbands participating in government. So they began to be dissatisfied. And then the second the market revolution hit, and the Second Great Awakening hits the United States at the same time. The market revolution gave a lot of these women what? Jobs. Jobs. Where now they're earning money and they're getting more power in their household. And the Second Great Awakening put these women in leadership positions in their churches. And a lot of women started preaching. And they thought, you know what? We can have more. We can have more rights. We can play more of a role in politics. 
So it's five by their greater, their larger role in religion, and as providers at home during the market revolution and the second great awakening, they're earning more money, they have more responsibilities in the church, and that inspired them to fight for political equality. Political equality. Women are also going to be very involved in other movements. They're very much heavily involved in the abolitionist movement. Not only were fighting, they were fighting for their own rights, they were fighting for African American rights. And a lot of them, because they're the victims of a lot of the alcoholism and abuse that alcoholism brought about in the family, a lot of them will be in the part of the temperance movement also. Two women that you definitely need to know the name of, Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. They're the founders of the modern day women's rights movement. What's the one thing that women can must have in order to get what they want, which is political equality. The government is never going to listen to them if they can't what? Vote. If they can't vote. That's the first step. If they can't get suffrage, if they can't get the right to vote, then nothing else matters. Because the only way they're going to let the they're going to make the politicians listen to what they want is having the ability to participate in elections. So Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott, they advocated for women's suffrage. Suffrage means the right to vote. So this is back in the early 1800s, in the middle of the 1800s. These women are fighting for suffrage, especially women's rights, but specifically suffrage. In Seneca Falls, New York, for the first time ever, we have in America a gathering of women in support of women's rights. Women from all over the United States gathered for the Seneca Falls Convention. There's a reason I underlined that and I bolded that, because it's important. This is, this is considered the first meeting of the women's rights movement in the United States, where they first gathered together to fight for equality. This is considered the beginning of the women's rights movement. The beginning of the women's rights movement. In this, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, this woman right here, read in front of the gathering what we call the Declaration of Sentiments. It's basically the Declaration of Independence, but instead of saying all men are created equal, what does it say? All men, all men and women are created equal. All men and women are created equal. The convention demanded the right to vote for women. And that's the beginning. However, women are not going to get what they want for a very long time. Anybody know when women are going to get the right to vote? 1920. Sorry? 1920. 1920, with the passage of the 19th, 19th Amendment, black men are going to get the right before them. We're going to get alcohol banned before women are allowed to vote. So however, the women's rights movement will not gain a lot of traction in the 1800s. For the most part, they're not going to get the right to vote. Um, and they will be overshadowed by the abolitionist movement, the movement that wanted to end slavery. They're the ones that are going to be gaining ground, not the women for the most part. African American rights are the ones that will be gaining ground, not women. All right, next one is the transcendentalist movement. This is a movement in philosophy, philosophy, thinking, rationality, philosophy, Arts and literature, books, paintings, art, novels. This is a movement of philosophy, arts, and literature. The transcendentalists believe that truth transcends the senses. They believe that there, you can find truth not just by observation, not just through touch, not just through smell or hearing or eyesight. You can find truth not just with observation. So I put that one cannot find truth with just observation and reason alone. They believe that to find truth, you have to find it inside yourself. Every person possesses an inner light that can illuminate the highest truth. 
I know this sounds like hippie stuff, but this is what they believe in. Truth is inside of you. Um, what is the one that says one cannot find the truth with this? Oh, but just observation with your, just your senses alone. The movement stress self-reliance. Self-independence and freedom. You can't just find truth with your senses, you have to find truth that exists inside of you that is a transcendentalist. Two people that you have to know about is Ralph Waldo Emerson, those of you that are going to go into English as a career, this is someone that you need to know, Ralph Waldo Emerson, an author, famous author, American author, one of the leaders of the Transcendentalist Movement. He wrote a book called The American Scholar, oh, I'm sorry, he made a speech in Harvard called The American Scholar Speech, and here's the problem with American literature and art back then. A lot of our American, a lot of the people that were writing in America, a lot of the American authors and a lot of the American painters, they weren't coming up with anything original. What they would do is they would copy the style of people in Europe. So they would copy the literary style and the artistic style of Europeans, because that was what's popular back then. What Henry David Thoreau, I'm sorry, what Ralph Waldo Emerson challenged Americans to do is to create a unique American style of writing and American style of art. A unique American style of writing and American style of art. And we're going to get that. We're going to get books that could only be made in the United States. Like, for example, um, those of you that are into literature, we have The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn and The Adventures of Tom Sawyer written in southern dialect, something that can only exist in the United States, a unique American style. I read that book. The Great Gatsby as well. Those are from the Transcendentalist movement. Don't look outward, look inward. Uh, Henry David Thoreau, another guy you need to remember, he published a book called On Duty of Civil Disobedience. This is the most important thing you need to remember for him, the concept of Civil disobedience. Civil disobedience. He said that if you do not agree with the government, then you can practice civil disobedience, which means breaking a law as a form of protest. So if you don't like what the government is doing, then don't follow the government. Ignore it. You have the right to do so. That's civil disobedience. He encouraged people to practice civil disobedience Break the law as a form of protest. Where have you heard that from before? When did people start doing that? Well, in the future, not in the past. This is the 1850s, the 1840s. What are, what's going to happen later on that has civil disobedience in it, that concept? Sorry? Like Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement, the African Americans to fight against racism and discrimination. They would break a lot of laws, like sit in places where they're not supposed to be sitting in, be in places where they're not supposed to be in. They're challenging the law as a form of protest. And that idea comes from um, Henry David Thoreau's civil disobedience. Also, Gandhi from India to resist the British occupation of India, he committed a lot of civil disobedience as well. And that idea, that idea comes from Henry David Thoreau in the early 1800s. So his ideas will inspire Martin Luther King and Gandhi later. Martin Luther King and Gandhi later on. All right, number six. Since we're going to talk about the abolitionist movement more in depth later on, um, we're, going to, we're going to skip over it for right now. We'll talk about it tomorrow. Advocated the end of slavery. Everybody should know that right now. Abolish means destroy, and the abolitionist movement wants to destroy the institution of slavery in the United States. All right, before we begin your quiz, anybody have any questions? Is it 
Some people is an attempt to get away from that. Um, there was a lot of consequences that came out of the, the Second Great Awakening, including um, the, the democratization of religion, more people participating in religion, women being allowed to participate, slaves getting converted into Christianity. Um, there's also the formation of new religions like the Baptist, the Methodist, the Mormons. There's also um, the idea of, of utopianism where we need to create a perfect world, a perfect community. So a lot of people separated from the American civilization and they created their own forms of community, like the Oneida community, for example, the Shaker. New Harmony and the Brook Farm. The Shakers were a religious group that came out of, of the time. Anybody else have any questions? Oneida is a utopian group. So they, they left American civilization, they settled in their own thing, they believed in having one family for everybody, everybody's, everybody's able to have sex with whoever they want, basically. That's the Oneida. So who's Ralph Waldo Emerson? Ralph Waldo Emerson is the guy we just talked about. Oh, right now? So the transcendentalist. Maybe. <laughs> I noticed some of you were not paying attention. Anybody else have any questions? changes to make a better country. Is this just one answer? It's one answer, yes. Sorry? The Second Great Awakening will inspire black people seeking social changes to make the United States better. The answer is on the board. Little people that wanted to change the United States, what do we call them? Those groups that wanted to change the United States for the better. 
what did we just, what the hell did we just talk about today? Number two, there are, they, these are religious groups formed during the Second Great Awakening. They experienced a lot of persecu persecution. They had their leader die, murdered, forcing them to flee and establish a new society in Utah. This is a religious group. Uh, All right, guys, yesterday we talked about cases, about the establishment clause and the free exercise clause. We got angle versus vitality for the establishment clause. Um, in this particular case, the Supreme Court supported freedom of, spe uh, freedom of religion over um, the interests of, of the government to have school prayers or the interests of the Christians to have school prayers in schools. This outlawed any school-sponsored prayer in the United States. Make sure you remember that. Wisconsin versus Yoder. Um, the Supreme Court supported, again, the free exercise of a religion uh, against the state's interest to have an educated population. They ruled in favor of the Amish. We talked about the conflict between social order and free speech, how that sometimes national security and social order can sometimes come into conflict with each other. Next, we got Tinker versus Des Moines. The Supreme Court decided in this particular case that free speech is more important than the school's interest to preserve order in their education. And then we talked about how even though speech is a right, it is not an absolute right. There are certain regulations that can be put on it. In Schneck versus United States, the president of um, Sep clear and present danger was established where speech that presents a clear and present danger is not protected by the First Amendment. Hopefully you're listening because we have a quiz today. And if you're off somewhere else, you just miss out on a bunch of questions. All right. There are certain restrictions that can be put on freedom of speech. We talked about how government can sometimes control the time that speech takes place, where it takes place, and how that speech um, is presented. There can be time, place, and manner restrictions sometimes, especially if that form of speech is also um, interfering with somebody else's right. Like, for example, protesting in the middle of the road would impede somebody's freedom of movement. So that can be regulated by the courts because you are infringing on someone else's right. So time, place, manner, that can be regulated by the government sometimes, especially if there's an infringement on someone's right. Is defamatory speech protected by the First Amendment? No. No, it's not. It can be regulated. We can make laws against defamatory speech. Defamatory speech is any speech that accuses somebody of something that is false that can injure someone's reputation. But you need to prove in court that you have been injured by that statement somehow, financially, emotionally, or physically, that that <coughs> statement or that false accusation injures you somehow, you need to prove that in court before you can have a case of defamation. If it's a harmless accusation, then you don't have a case. That is not regulated, that is not controlled. Like today, we have a lot of controversy about women falsely accusing men of sexual assault. That can be covered under defamatory speech because that you can prove that you they have caused injury somehow to that person that they're accusing. So we talked about the difference between libel and slander, correct? Yes. Both of them are defamatory speech. Libel is written, slander is spoken. Is hate speech protected by the First Amendment? Yes. yes, it is. Hate speech is protected unless it incites eminent danger. So here's what I mean by this. Hate speech is usually protected by the First Amendment, uh, by the Supreme Court, unless that speech directly leads to uh, an immediate um, lawless action. So for example, I can say black people are the worst. That's hate speech. That's allowed. That's protected by the First Amendment. But if I say black people are the worst, so we should kill them right now, that is not allowed because that presents or that can trigger an immediate um, lawless action. Does everybody get the difference? So this is the Westboro Baptist Church. We talked about them yesterday. Uh, there's been a lot of laws made against what they're doing. 
protesting. A lot of them protest in soldiers' funerals, and they bring signs like, God hates your kid, or God wants your, your, your son to die, okay, very hateful, hurtful things. Um, and whenever a state tries to make a law that will prevent them from doing that, it's usually shut down. Usually these guys, they follow the, the rules, like if there's a rule in a state that says you need to be outside of a funeral if you want to protest in the funeral, they follow that, so they don't really violate anything. So it's a mistake to try to sue them when it comes to freedom of speech, because it's usually protected by the First Amendment. Obscenity is something that is lewd or sexual. Go ahead, that's where we left off last time. Take out your notes from last time. Is your team again? They're not in there. They're not in there. All right, guys. Shh. Oh, there I know, guys. Obscenity is overtly lewd or sexual speech or expression. It is often not protected by the First Amendment. So, protesting naked in the streets would be considered obscenity, and that will not be protected by the First Amendment. That form of expression, even though it's symbolic, uh, government interest or the people's interest to not see those things supersedes freedom of speech in the obscenity case. Restrictions can be imposed on obscene material. Like pornography, for example, there's only certain places where pornography is allowed, it can be regulated, it is not protected by the First Amendment when it comes to, uh, when it comes to pornography. The problem the Supreme Court has and the problem that we have today about obscenity is it's very difficult to figure out what is obscene material and what is not obscene material. There have been many attempts by the courts to try to figure that out. However, um, it's still very broad the way they define obscenity. They try to come up with a test that would determine what is obscene and what is not obscene. It's, um, it's called the Miller test. The Miller test is three prong. Number one, if a speech increases interest in sex, then it may not be protected by the First Amendment. Number two, if a speech or expression depicts or describes sexual conduct, then it may not be protected by the First Amendment. And the last thing is, um, if a speech lacks educational, um, literary, or artistic value, then it may not be protected by the First Amendment. So let's go through a test together. Let's do 50 Shades of Grey. Let's apply the Miller test to 50 Shades of Grey. First test, does it increase interest in sex? Yes. 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 A lot of well, <laughs> I was going to say for middle-aged women, but a lot of you said yes right away, so they failed that test. Number two, does it show or describe sexual conduct? Yes, it does. But what does it have? It passes a third test, which is what? It has some literary value, it has some artistic value, so therefore it's okay in some circumstances, in some contexts. Um, if you have anatomy classes where they describe the reproductive system and they show naked people in there, that's okay because it has what? Literary value. Even if it fails those first two, even if it gets you horny when you're reading your biology book, it, it, it still has educational value. So that's obscenity. It's not protected by the First Amendment. It can be regulated. <laughs> Anyone have any questions? All right, we're going to go to our, our next lesson today before we tackle your tests. We're going to talk about freedom of press right now. Freedom of press. Make sure you have your notes with you. Freedom of press. There's only one page. You just attach it because it's the second part to your lesson. New York Times versus the United States. This is one of the most important cases in U.S. history. But well, before that, when it comes to freedom of the press, the Supreme Court usually has one rule, and that rule is no prior restraint. Generally, in the United States, this is rock solid. This is a rule, a president that the Supreme Court has established over and over again. When it comes to journalism, and when it comes to newspapers and publication, there is certainly, generally, no prior restraint. And this 
is usually rock solid. What is prior restraint? What does prior mean? Before restraint means to limit. Prior restraint means government censorship. Before a publication comes out, government is usually not allowed to censor that publication. You cannot censor expression before that expression is made. Now, once the expression is made, once that article is published, if there's something illegal in it, then the Supreme Court can, then the federal government and the Supreme Court can come after that person. But generally, the government needs to let that get published, needs to let that come out. Because again, remember, when it comes to freedom of the press, there is usually no government censorship beforehand. When it's published, once the expression comes out, then it's fine to regulate it. It's fine to punish those people for whatever they put on there, but they cannot censor it before it comes out. Does that make sense for everybody? And usually, that is rock solid. There's very little circumstances where the Supreme Court is going to change its mind about that. Give me some circumstances where the Supreme Court might change its mind about that. During wartime, when it risks what? If it risks national security, then that can be um, that can all can, that can be broken. But besides that, it's usually very rock solid. So I'll give you an example. The United States is the only country in the world that possesses stealth technology in our fighter planes. This is a B-21 BAT bomber. It is stealth. Doesn't mean it's invisible. It's invisible by radar. It cannot be detected by radar. Which means when we fly over and try to bomb somebody, they won't know because they can't detect it. Most planes, they could. This, they cannot. We're the only country in the world that has this technology. We're so confident that we're the only one in the world that has this technology that if you notice, this doesn't have any machine guns. This doesn't have a way to protect itself because we're not anticipating it being in a dogfight because we know it's never going to get detected. If somehow you get a hold of that, the secret to that technology, and then you try to reveal it to in a publication, then the Supreme Court might allow government to do what? Censure. To, censure, uh, to censor it before it comes out, because it can endanger what? National, National security. security. That makes sense for everybody. Mm -hmm. So usually the rule of the Supreme Court that there's no prior restraint, no government censorship beforehand is rock solid. Not a lot of people challenge it. 1971, Nixon challenges the no prior restraint rule, and that's what we're going to be covering today. But in the 1970s, a lot of people were tired of the Vietnam War. A lot of people wanted our troops to go home already. And what, what didn't help that fact is there was a guy, I forgot his name, I think he's on here. His name is Daniel Ellsberg. He got a hold of government top secret information about how much are we really involved in Vietnam. And it turns out that President Johnson lied to Congress and lied to the American people how really how much involvement we really had in Vietnam. It turns out we were involved much more than they were saying. But he got a hold of those documents and he decided to leak those documents to the New York Times and the Washington Post so that they can go ahead and publish them. When Nixon, because Nixon is president, John, um, Andrew Johnson's term is up, Nixon became president. When Nixon found out about those papers, we called them the Pentagon Papers, those top secret information, when Nixon found out about the Pentagon Papers, he tried to issue an injunction on the New York Times to prevent them from what? From publishing it. What do we call that? It's prior restraint, right? He's censoring. Uh, censoring, censoring something before it comes out. And usually what does the Supreme Court say about that? Can the government do that? No. no, usually it says no about that. But Nixon has a reason in this particular case. He says the information that will come out in the Pentagon Papers can endanger our men in Vietnam. So he's, re he's, he's using what as a reason? National, National security. security. What comes out in that paper can present clear and present danger to our troops in Vietnam. He's using the president established in which court case 
to get that censored in Schneck versus United States. Remember the pamphlet against the draft. He's using that president as a reason to censor um, the Pentagon Papers from coming out, from people finding out the truth. So the Supreme Court has to answer one question. Do they allow the government, the federal government, to break their no prior restraint rule in this particular case? Is there enough compelling national security risk to do that, to, um, to violate freedom of the press? Anybody remember what the Supreme Court said? Did the Supreme Court protect freedom of the press, or did they favor national security more in this particular case? They favored freedom of the press. And they said Nixon did not prove that these papers in court could not prove that these papers are actually endangering our men in Vietnam. So the proof of national security was not there. And the Supreme Court, and this is the important part of Nixon, um, I'm sorry, United States, Washington Post versus the United States. What was it called? New York Times versus the United States. They said that they, there is a heavy burden, there's a heavy burden. If you want to go against this no prior restraint rule, there is a heavy burden to do that. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to work really hard to go against the no prior restraint rule of the Supreme Court. There's only very little instances, very special circumstances where the Supreme Court is going to allow the government to censor something before it comes out. If the government wants to do that, then it better have massive amounts of proof that national security is at risk. So this decision is a big victory for who? Who benefits from this? Which people specifically? Somebody, I heard it over here. The press, the journalists, right? Because what was protected? Freedom of the press. That they know that they can probably publish whatever they want not right now because it's very, very difficult according to the Supreme Court. There's a heavy burden of proof to go against that rule. They know that whatever they're going to publish, it's probably the government has to let them publish it. The government is going to be unable to censor that without having a ton of evidence against the no prior restraint rule. Anybody confused? Let's fill this out. I don't think we have that. We should. Up to, we just have up to New York Times the United States. I got y'all. Why is that? You don't have the no prior restraint thing? No. All right, just copy it down. Prior restraint, government censorship for speech. Government um, censorship of speech or expression before that speech or expression is made. This is still related with freedom of speech, but this is mainly about freedom of the press. Something you need to remember. Generally, government is not allowed to censor expression, especially before that expression is made. So the Supreme Court has ruled that generally, government is not allowed to impose prior restraint. You can put that in there if you want. The Supreme Court has generally ruled that government is not allowed to impose no prior restraint. Questions? Moving on? Slower you are the last time you have for your quiz. 
slow it. <laughs> Alright, we're moving on. It's not, you can get this from someone else. It's not allowed to impose prior restraint. To impose prior restraint. Alright, moving on. By the late 1960s, Americans are becoming increasingly wary of the Vietnam War. Oh, that's why. Okay. This document. In 1970, Daniel Ellsberg leaked the top secret history of the U.S. involvement in Vietnam. This document is known as the Pentagon Papers. It revealed that President Johnson had lied to Congress and the American people. Like Congress and the American people. The Nixon administration attempted to uh, prevent the publication of the Pentagon Papers by the New York Times. The federal government argued that the Pentagon Papers would endanger national security. Answer that question on your own. What's Nixon, what's, what case is Nixon trying to appeal to? Which case? Uh, Shank versus the United States. You can't spell that. Try your best. Wait, what? what was it? Shank versus the United States. All right, what's the constitutional question? Did the Nixon administration violate the First Amendment's protection of freedom of speech and the press by attempting to prevent the publication of the Pentagon Papers? Remember, prevention of, prevention of expression is usually a no-no to the Supreme Court. Prior restraint is usually a no-no. That's why this is so controversial. The Supreme Court said yes, the Nixon administration did violate the protection for freedom of the press. The court decided that there is a heavy burden of proving that prior restraint by government is necessary. There's a heavy burden for the government to prove that prior restraint is necessary. They ruled that the federal government had not met that burden in United States and New York Times versus the United States. It outlined two reasons for this. Number one, the First Amendment supports the view that press should be left to freely publish without government censorship or public or prior restraint. They said the First Amendment protects the, the, the press from having their articles um, prior restraint or imposed prior restraint on them. The court were not convinced that the Pentagon Papers would um, endanger military personnel in Vietnam. It did not provide enough proof for that. Was the last one met? Sorry? So let's talk about the impact. The Supreme Court bolstered the freedom of the press by establishing that there is a heavy burden to go up against the no prior restraint rule. It's very difficult to go up against the no prior restraint rule, according to the Supreme Court. So freedom of the press, heavy. The court established that more often than not, it will strike down any attempts by the government to censor the press before that expression is made. They're going to strike down that attempt. The court prioritized freedom of the press over the government's interest in preserving national security in this particular case. Freedom of the press won out against national security. Before we take a test today, does anybody have any questions? Angle versus uh huh. Okay. Um, they favored not the not the freedom of the two clauses: free exercise and establishment. Angle versus Vitale is about which clause? Establishment. The establishment clause. Whether or not the government and religion are mixing too much. So they favored the separation of church and state than what the majority of the United States wanted, which is school prayers in the United States. Anybody else have a question? Uh, civil liberties, civil rights. Civil liberties are your protections against government. They're your guarantees against government. Your civil rights are protections against discrimination. 
Anybody else? Is it on paper? You'll see. Anybody else? Your amendments will also be on there. Anybody have a question on the first? Uh, Make sure you know the two clauses of the freedom of religion, what it does. Free exercise and establishment. If you don't know those, you need to ask me. Thinker versus Des Moines was about the black armbands during the Vietnam War. The Supreme Court said that symbolic speech, even nonverbal, nothing with words, is protected by the First Amendment. That is speech. Establishment and free exercise has to do with religion. Yes, ma'am. Due process, self-incrimination, um, double jeopardy, and due process. There you go. Do you have to know all of them? What's that? Do you have to know all of them? Well, you need to know where it's from. Fourth Amendment, freedom from unreasonable search and seizures. Which one protects you from unreasonable punishments or cruel and unusual punishment? That is the eighth. Which one gives you the right to a lawyer? Six. That is the right to a lawyer, a right to a speedy trial, a right to a uh, trial by jury of your peers. Seven. It's the same thing. It's right to trial by jury, like just like the six, but it's for the civil. Six is for the criminal. Everybody know what the ninth does. Make sure you know what the ninth does. It's about the sleeping, the unenumerated, unlisted rights, personal freedom in the Constitution. Third is quartering. Fourth is. Third is yeah, third is quarter. Oh, you don't have to. Anybody else about the cases from yesterday? Make sure you know Thinker versus Des Moines, Angle versus uh, Angle versus Vitali, Wisconsin versus Yoder. Are we gonna talk about the due process clause? Healthy. Due process clause. Remember the Fourteenth Amendment's due process clause allows for what? The selective incorporation of the Bill of Rights to who? The states. The states. Make sure you know what selective incorporation means. One by one, case by case basis, exactly. Through using what as justification again? What part of the Constitution justifies incorporation? The 14th Amendment's what? Due uh, process clause. Uh, anybody have anybody else have any questions? They're gonna be quizzed on the last two days. Alright, people are still having confusion about selective incorporation. That shouldn't be uh, that's where it basically is the fifth amendment. Sorry. Yeah, ma <laughs> yes, ma'am. Okay. Daphne, you had a question? No. Sorry. All right, going once. Oh, I've never been to the amendment. Twice. Yeah. Sold. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sold. Jerry said. Sorry? It's called Texas V. Johnson. You don't need to know that. But it's very similar to Tinker versus Des Moines, and that symbolic speech is protected. Well, I can buy an iPhone with that. Do you need money or what? Wait, what? sir. So, selective incorporation. Uh-huh. What? what is that? In Barron versus Baltimore, in 1833, the Supreme Court said that the Bill of Rights only applied to the federal government and did not apply to the states. So the states can technically violate those guarantees that are in the, in the Bill of Rights. But then, after the Civil War, we added a constitutional amendment, which is the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, and it has the Equal Protection Clause, you don't need to care about that for right now, and a Due, pro shh, and a due Process Clause in the 14th Amendment. The due Process Clause says no state can deny anybody um, the due process of law, which means that the government has to respect your rights, including the rights found where? In the Bill of Rights. So because of the Due Process Clause, states are forced to recognize your liberties that are found in the, in the Bill of Rights. Does that make sense? The Supreme Court said, we're not going to apply all of those at once to the states. That's called total incorporation. We're not going to do that. What we're going to do is we're going to allow people to challenge the Supreme Court, to challenge their state, and we're going to apply those provisions one by one, case by case basis. 
The first one was freedom of, of speech with Gitlow versus New York. The last one was in 2010 with the right to bear arms with McGall versus Scott. So we're going to incorporate them one by one, case by case basis. That's the 14th Amendment. Anybody else have any questions? I need to put away your notes. You need a device. All right. Here we go. No, you can borrow somebody's notes so you can start filling in. I believe we're here, right? Yeah. Tell you to take it, or you actually come to three days. Unless you really want to. No. <sighs> You have a time limit, guys? We have to do something else. What? I heard. It's online, guys. It's on the Civil Liberties Quiz. You can see it. Just take it right away. I don't think that works, Francisco. Turn, go to the other one. Thank you so much.